<laughs> oh, only a minute late. That's not bad. <laughs> Hi there. Welcome, everybody, to what we do uh, here on this channel anyway, every Wednesday. And we uh, do a tradition that we call Cast Iron Wednesday, where a lot of these uh, smaller YouTube cooking channels, I guess, including mine, do a cast iron video on Wednesday. You know, whether it's uh, cooking something in cast iron or seasoning cast iron or talking about cast iron. Uh, not many of the channels <clears throat> do these live videos on Wednesdays, but then again, yeah, not uh, most of those channels are probably smarter than I am because as uh, the folks who have been here before know, uh, doing a live cooking video on YouTube is, well, there's one reason why we call this cast iron chaos. So thank you very much to everybody who has, uh, show, who, uh, has shown up here tonight. Uh, either out of curiosity or because you've actually been here before. Thank you so much. Actually, there are a number of uh, faces or names, at least I should say, that uh, I see here uh, tonight. And uh, some of them are ones who've been here before. Thank you again. Hello, everybody, to Rick Stumbau and Chris4774 and David Craig and Val's Black Cat's Rule. And Cynthia Wesley, Shadow Walker XM, and uh, all the uh, uh, a number of the regulars. Hello, roadside assistance guy, and Christine Borgatti. Always nice to uh, see you here tonight. So, uh, or any night here. Um, yes, and uh, well, as you can see, we've got the camera focused on a uh, couple of cast iron pans because, of course, that's the idea here. And we are here, uh, as the um, title of this video says tonight, we are. Looking at some uh, some uh, pans, especially having to do with America, because after all, this coming weekend we have Memorial Day. That um, fine. Uh, oh, hello. Uh, uh, am I pronouncing this right? Nessus River Catfishing. Are you actually on time? Yes, you are. We just started, so thank you for showing up. But yes, this weekend is Memorial Day, where we um, uh, here in the United States, as you know. We do a lot of celebration of the American spirit, and especially, probably most importantly, we uh, pay our respects and tribute and other remembrances for those who have unfortunately uh, paid uh, the ultimate price in the service of their country. That includes, of course, uh, almost all of the uh, brave uh, soldiers who have uh, indeed laid down their lives in the, under the uh, service of the United States of America. Um, I should say <clears throat> right now, though, nonetheless, that uh, here on this channel, for the most part, I do my best to avoid politics, uh, even in regards to a uh, sir, something like Memorial Day, where, of course, there are a lot of politics involved. Well, quite frankly, we are a cooking channel first, a uh, political channel, well, not even second, more like 73rd or so. And as such, we are here <clears throat> to have fun tonight. And that does include, of course, paying our respects for uh, those for those folks we know uh, who are in active duty or are retired or veterans or uh, indeed anybody, uh, anybody who we feel uh, deserves a uh, word of mention. <clears throat> here from, uh, for the upcoming Memorial Day. And please feel free to say that as well, uh, especially because, again, Memorial Day is uh, approaching. I should mention my brother, who I think I've mentioned a couple of times, who is, in fact, a 30-year uh, veteran of the United States Army. He has served in the uh, 82nd Airborne. He was in the uh, first Iraq War back in the uh, early, uh, two, you know, um, when was that? Oh man, in the 1990s, in fact, during the first invasion of uh, Kuwait and uh, Iraq. So yes, we. Uh, so really, it's gone back a ways in our family. Even my father, my birth father, as I found out, he would he actually did serve his country as well. But that's about all I'm going to mention here because uh, we are getting on to the uh, cast iron tonight. Uh, <clears throat> Hello to everybody as well. Hello, Clico and Cynthia Wesley. Uh, I do hope, by the way, this is act. The sound is actually showing up. I'm hoping. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, folks can uh, hear uh, what we're saying here, uh, because well, we are here as well to uh, pay uh, to take a look at some cast iron made in America, especially dedicated to America. And that's why I'm proud, at least, to make this the uh, debut. Oh, thank you very much. Sounds perfect. 
<clears throat> that's why I guess I'm proud to make this the debut of a pan that uh, we've mentioned on this channel uh, recently because it only just premiered this month. And in this case, that would be the Cracker Barrel um, Lady no, Walking Liberty Half Dollar Skillet, uh, which I acquired from Cracker Barrel as they were actually still putting it out on the shelf. So, yeah, I didn't waste time to actually <clears throat> get a look at that skillet, uh, to uh, get one of those skillets. Because, yeah, this particular image, besides being very, you know, a very attractive uh, image, uh, a lot better than some of the images we've seen on some of these cast iron pans. Uh, the Walking Liberty half dollar means something to me as well, because uh, my mo because it actually reminds me. Here we go again of mom of my mother. Uh, that's partly, largely, in fact, because <clears throat> one of my earliest hobbies back before I was even ten years old was coin collecting, and I got into that largely because of my parents, of course, mom and dad. They would uh, get seriously into hobbies every few years and then drop them like a rock and move on. Uh, but nonetheless, this was one of the earliest hobbies that I uh, shared with them, and I genuinely enjoyed it, not just because they did. Uh, I had a small uh, collection of coins, largely ones that they acquired for me, of course, and I learned a lot about uh, vintage American coins, among which, by the way, was one of mom's favorite uh, designs of coins uh, that really meant something to her was, in fact, the Walking Liberty Half Dollar. Uh, the 50 cent coin, of course, from the early uh, first half of the 20th century. And it was that coin there. When I saw that they were actually putting that on a cast iron pan, you better believe I had to actually go <clears throat> and uh, get one for myself. So um, naturally, you know, scalpers and eBay uh, uh, grifters and the like, they're trying to make uh, collector's items out of pretty much any cast iron pan, especially ones that are out of the ordinary like this. And for that reason, I know uh, they're already trying to sell this thing on eBay for uh, ridiculous prices, like maybe three times what you paid for a Cracker Barrel. Yet... The design of this pan is so nice that I'm pretty sure that it may indeed be a cra uh, collector's item. So these pans tend to sell out usually before the uh, 4th of July holiday. So I guess the best I can say with that is if you want one, you should indeed, uh, let me turn on this pan here, go and get one. Um, there's a lot more about these made in America pans, but uh, we're also here to have a little fun as well. And so that means I've, um, I've actually have this heating up on the stove to uh, cook with it for the first time because I want my uh, all of my pans to be users, not just uh, for display purposes. So I'm intending to get some as much use as I can out of this Walking Liberty uh, half dollar. Uh, let me move in a little bit closer, in fact. There we go. And so because of that, <clears throat> I figured if nothing else, we'd do something nice and easy tonight and in, and uh, make one of those dishes that everybody who has served in the uh, United States Armed Forces probably knows and, well, remembers so fondly, or maybe not so fondly. And that, of course, would be your good old SOS. So, yes, indeed, we're just making some nice and easy shite on a shangle here tonight. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry about that. Still have this cough, I'm afraid. Which, of course, gives us a chance to uh, play with some cast iron, and I'm more than happy to uh, oblige on that. Um, besides, this is uh, such an easy dish, really. It's like anybody can, it's one of those dishes that anybody can do, and yes, because I've only learned how to cook in the past several years or so, or the last 10 years, I'm very glad to have learned how to uh, make SOS myself. <laughs> um, it's really no more than making yourself a roux and, uh, and uh, seasoning it up. Uh, it, the uh, army version, of course, means you season it up with uh, meat. So uh, supposedly the official version of SOS uses what they call chipped beef. Of course, uh, for a lot of folks, their mo more popular version is what they call hamburger gravy, which is where you uh, brown up some uh, ground beef and mix that in with your roux. And that is really what I'm going to be starting out with because, uh, yeah, you know, if you've ever had this stuff, boy, this stuff is salty as all get out. So it actually doesn't taste too bad, but you really, really need to mix it in with stuff so that it'll dilute the salt. 
And that's why I've got some good old, um, come on, there we go. That's why I've got about a pound or so of good old American ground beef. And uh, that should help indeed to dilute the sag, the, um, the chipped beef, as they call it, or dried beef. So now's the chance to start having some fun. And I better do this quickly, in fact, before the old smoke detector goes off again. So there we go. We have just broken in our um, skillet, our uh, walking liberty skillet here. So uh, now this is no longer, no, well, I'll say it once. It's no longer a virgin skillet. <clears throat> and that's all, that's the only suggested joke I'm going to make about that tonight. Uh, besides, Breaking it in with some good old SOS gravy is not a bad way to start off with a cast iron skillet. I know they say, cook bacon in it. And yeah, I guess you could say bacon is pretty patriotic too, but I thought we would do something, well, I shouldn't say different because of course, you know, hamburger gravy is very, very common and popular. And there's really nothing wrong with that either. I just literally threw this into the uh, pan without even, without adding any seasoning because we're really not going to need much of it. Um, I mean, after all, the beef is tasty enough by itself. And as I just mentioned, I'm about to mix in this uh, dried beef to uh, go along with it. Oh, this is uh, yeah, not the not the most expensive ground beef either. It's something like about a 75 uh, percent lean, meaning that it's got a lot of fat in it which is also good for making a roux. So uh, all told, this is uh, going to be a nice, uh, tasty gravy. I have little doubt about that. And after the initial uh, dry spot, dryness there of putting it in the pan, as you can see, uh, not only is it starting to brown already, but uh, really there's not much in the way of sticking. Any bits that stick to the pan, they are uh, coming off nice and easily. Which is one thing I say and, ha and say repeatedly in regards to modern day lodge cast iron skillets. I love them. I love cooking in modern day lodge skillets. I love cooking in vintage skillets. I love cooking in just about any cast iron skillet. Uh, notice I just simply really use this pretty much after with the same seasoning that was put on it when it was uh, sent to the store. I did not uh, grind it down. I did not get myself any kind of a sander or anything and grind down the uh, surface. And yet, as you can see, there is really no serious sticking at all with this stuff. Hi, so, oh, hello, Jamie. Hi. And uh, Jamie says hi to everybody. So, oh, yes, that's right. You need keys. Yes. Mimi, no home. There we go. Okay, we'll do. Oh, yeah. And Kenneth Kemian, uh, I still can't pronounce that right. Kemianaki, uh, love getting smoked chip beef. Yeah, I'm sure uh, smoking this stuff is probably a lot better than what I'm doing, which is, of course, taking it right out of the jar here. Hmm. Um, it's uh, near the top there. I think it's already scrolled off. Yeah. And Pip Gorn. <laughs> yeah. Phonetically, yeah, so we don't get it wrong. I, would, I really like to preach that. I don't want to be calling anybody by the wrong pronunciation of their name. I know it's, it's no idea to happen. Yes, <laughs> we, not, not that, we got that one right now. Right? Yeah, we call the ground beef gravy beef almost stroganoff. <laughs> and uh, Cynthia Wesley in Louisiana, we mostly do Tony's and highly flavored seasonings and Cajun. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely on my bucket list is to visit Louisiana Hi, one Hi, of these Debbie. days. Hello, and Jamie is uh, greeting everybody. Oh, yeah, no, go ahead. So, yeah. Nothing wrong at all with water lodge. It holds seasoning very well. My experience is what Michi Beaches, River of Catfishes. I agree with you. It doesn't have to be glass slick to cool well, cook well. Exactly. Hi, Jamie. Hey, well, you already spelled it right. Nice. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Sounds very Did you strip manufacturing seasoning and reseason in your pan? Uh, this one, as a matter of fact, I did not. I'm using the seasoning that came right out of the uh, right from the store. Okay, we're rolling rough too. Cool, Jamie. Woo! Rich Woo! Yeah, it's Jamie here. Hmm. Hi, Jamie. Hi, hi, everybody. <laughs> Hello. Mm -hmm. Hello, loves little Jamie. I'm surprised by how much my modern lodge smooths out after a lot of use. Oh, yeah, definitely. 
This is actually pretty smooth, even for a lodge pen, I think. That is my favorite pen right there. A lodge pen? That, that is, that's the, no, that's not my favorite Oh, pen. yours is the black lodge. Oh, yeah, that's not the pen. Yeah. No. Yeah. This the is still a, yeah, this is still a nice Hi, pen, though. Hi, Oh, yeah. Actually, <laughs> yes. You like me. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, I've got a. I have to bring my son home right now, guys. I'll be back relatively quickly, and actually, maybe I'll help out Eric by doing the reading. This seems to work out really well. That would actually help a lot. I, yes, will, actually, so. I will do that. I will okay. be involved. All right. Nonetheless. Yes. Uh, nonetheless, while this stuff is still uh, bubbling away in the pan and hopefully forming something of a something of a crispy crust, which is what we love about our ground beef. Now we got to uh, risk life and limb and open the stuff. And that's good by good old Hormel. Talk about American companies. Oh, that was easier than I thought. Here's what it looks like on the inside. <laughs> Gee, boy, doesn't this look appetizing. It's, it is indeed dried beef. Comes in a glass jar. And... I take it out. There we are. Like a, oops, let me do it this way. There we are, like a deck of cards. So let's straighten this out. I'm going to quickly chop this up as best as I can here. Let's move this out of the way. <laughs> but yeah, as I mentioned, boy, I mean, this stuff actually, the nice thing is, this stuff is, uh, it, it, as you can see, it actually, is no is hardly difficult at all to cut. It's not tough. It's actually uh, quite tender. So I, I mean, I've got a good knife too, and that certainly helps. But even so, this is not taking. This is not any difficult at all. There's no difficulty at all in uh, in cutting this stuff up. That barely took a few seconds, in fact. So now we get to let's just put this in with our ground beef. Okay, so there we are. This is going to be like the military SOS, but with a wee bit more flavor, you know, because of the uh, the ground beef. And likewise, as I mentioned, hopefully the ground beef will absorb the salty taste from uh, this uh, other stuff. <laughs> yeah, this is usually the part where when you were young, dad would come into the kitchen and take a look at that, and he'd say, you know what that looks like? And I'm not even going to answer that. <laughs> Actually, surprisingly enough, either this is absorbing the grease or <clears throat> because you know, we're not really not seeing a lot of grease in here at all, which is not a bad thing either, especially since, as I mentioned, this is only about, whoops, missed a piece. Ooh, hot. Ow, hot. My bad. Fortunately, the heat is going to kill any cooties. Anyway. Yeah, like I said, I was worried that this might be drowning in grease, but is, in fact, doing uh, quite the opposite here. So we are doing pretty good. I think that means I can just simply throw in the butter and the um, flour and just make the roux without even uh, taking this stuff out of the pan. Nice and simple. There's really nothing to it. And what else do we have? Uh, Christine Borgatti, my my daughter went to school in New Orleans and would stop at every trip at the Lodge Outlet in Gatlinburg. Oh yeah, boy, is that that place ever tempting? That's for sure. <laughs> and while we're doing that, I think I'll mention a little bit more as well. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, there, you know, especially over the past decade or so, since Cast Iron has made a real comeback. Um, more and more of these companies are making their cast iron pans for the collector's market. Uh, you know, Lodge really seems to be coming out with a collector's item pan every year. In fact, two of them uh, this year, one of which is the, um, well, this uh, Cracker Barrel skillet, which they've been uh, producing every year. The other one, of course, which we've also seen recently, is the new Lodge Made in America skillet, the one that they uh, have produced pretty much as a follow-up to their Made in America series. I'm definitely going to have to do a video really talking more about that because there's some something about, yeah, because, yeah, 
even though that Made in America series is only about only lasted three years, you know, nineteen, yeah, nineteen, two thousand eighteen through two thousand twenty. Uh, there is indeed some uh, interesting history already involved with that. And let me quickly find. Yeah, this will do. Scrape this stuff off here. But yeah, I mean there there have been uh, these uh, Amer yeah these pans really that have that pay tribute to America, and I like bringing them out around uh, this time each year, especially to uh, help pay tribute to America. And I'm not being sarcastic when I put the emphasis on the word America, but uh, you know it's largely because you know. They're, they really make they really make a big deal up out of it out of this holiday, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. You could even say that's what holidays are for. Nonetheless, we got to add a little bit more grease to this pan. Here's another piece here. So that means time to throw in about a half a stick of butter. And then after that, we will add in our flour. And lo and behold, we'll have the basis for our roux. And it won't take long at all to melt this butter, not in a hot pan like this. This is cast iron. And that's, in fact, you, you got to be careful not to get it too hot. Uh, I have my stove top, for the record, at uh, just about medium heat here. And this is more than enough to really, in fact, I might even have to turn this down a little bit once I add the flour and the milk and everything. So, um, because I don't want to burn it. And also, I don't want my gravy to be too thick. Anyway, it's not taking long at all to mix in this butter, that's for sure. Let's see what else we have here. Ah, uh, great old-fashioned sea pot. Uh, the chickens are old-fashioned coffee pot. The chickens are thawing now, and we'll get dismembered and have the buttermilk spa treatment tomorrow. Ah, sounds like somebody is doing uh, some good old fried chicken over this weekend, and there's nothing wrong with that. I plan on doing uh, some fried chicken in the near, very near future myself. Um, may or may not be on Monday, Memorial Day. I have to say, even though this may sound a little disappointing... I am unfortunately assigned to the work pager to be on call on Monday, Memorial Day, because we do have a schedule and people do have to, people do make their emergency calls even on holidays. So I was the lucky one who happened to be scheduled for uh, this coming Monday. So even though it's not going to be the most exciting Memorial Day, I will be relaxing in between calls anyway. And that's just how it goes in America. <laughs> All right, we have got ourselves quite a bit of meat in this pan. We now have ourselves some butter, which means now it's time to throw in throw that out. Throw in just a quarter cup of flour. It's one thing I've I've been practicing as well, my gravy. Uh, I pretty much, if there's any cooking mistake to be made, I've made it and I'm doing my best to try to correct myself, such as adding too much flour to the roux, ending up with a roux that is incredibly massively thick. Um, yeah, this is one of those lessons I've had to learn the hard way and I can only hope I'm, uh, learning it bit by bit. Yeah, you know, we just simply... Mix in, mix it all around, and most importantly, cook off the roux so that there won't be any kind of a floury or pasty taste to it uh, when the gravy is actually done. But with the, especially with all the salt from this chi from this chipped beef, I have little doubt that there that there's not going to be any, any problem at all with that. In fact, there's a nice amount now of grease and liquid in this pan. So all I really have to do is stir this for maybe about, a, oh, I don't know, maybe another minute or so. And this sure isn't taking long e either. Uh, again, I am so glad to have learned how to cook because, yeah, as I said before, in the days before I learned how to cook, I never even knew how easy it was to make something as simple as SOS. 
make, making stuff like this, besides the fact that you're carrying on American traditions, it's also cheap. Um, much cheaper than buying stuff, pre-made stuff at the store. Also tastes better, too. So, all right. Okay, so I'm definitely uh, looking forward to uh, having some uh, SOS here tonight. Which is hardly the worst thing to celebrate Memorial Day with, even though Memorial Day is still a few days away. And what do we have right now? What's your favorite seasoning mixer oil? Uh, for oil, I find myself using corn oil myself a lot because it has a high smoke point. Um, it's not exactly neutral, but I like the taste that it adds. Uh, it's, and, and especially because it's so hard to burn. Seasoning, uh, hard to say. Other than the fact that I've got this passion for smoked paprika, thanks to Alton Brown, uh, I do have a tendency as well to go for Old Bay seasoning, uh, which is similar, of course, to Cajun seasoning, but not necessarily the same thing. And let's get this going here. We are almost ready. And, oh, good grief. Uh, now I get a pop-up from AVG. Your internet service provider may be selling your browsing and search history. Maybe. Uh, sorry, I'm not going to sign up for your service right now. Hello, Papa Dan. Hello, everybody. Been listening, just getting home from 212 uh, road trip to uh, get a piece of cast iron. Well, I hope it turned out well, that's for sure. Man after my own heart, Papa. What did you find? Yeah, we usually put garlic in the meat sauce, and that's not a bad thing either. I can just throw in some garlic powder if I want to. Okay. At this point, I would definitely say this is all cooked off, so all we really have to do now is start thickening it up, which means we get to add a little bit of milk. And that's the other thing I've learned about making gravy, and boy, did I have to learn this the hard way. Better turn this temperature down a little bit. Um, and it thickens up so quickly, too. Uh, as you can see, I only used a tiny bit of milk to start this off with, and already... It's just uh, sopped it all up. You don't want to add all of the milk all at once that, because um, it just does not give it the right consistency. If you add it just a little bit at a time, uh, you actually end up using less milk that way and you get the consistency you want. You can see how this absorbed everything nicely. So now we just add a little bit more. So far, I doubt I've really used even a cup of milk yet. I'm, I'm guessing maybe half to three quarters of a cup. It's bubbling away, and I have already turned my uh, temperature down. At this point, it's really just a matter of uh, getting the uh, right consistency more than anything else. Which also means I had better toast up a little bread. That's the other thing I learned when looking up uh, some uh, stuff about military. Uh, you know, um, sandwich bread or white bread, the stuff at the store that people uh, say, oh, you know, that stuff never goes bad, even though it does. And there have been some not so nice names made about, sand about white bread or sandwich bread. That stuff was, in fact, invented for military use because the military definitely needed uh, something like that, some uh, bread that would not instantly begin to mold and go and go bad. So that's one reason why they developed a, uh, I guess you could say, a bread that was more resistant to mold. As such, uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, I am very much in the camp, by the way, that is in favor of uh, things like uh, processed foods because I feel there are a lot of advantages to that. I mean, as you can see, I love making stuff from scratch, and I don't mind, na and I do enjoy natural ingredients. But that is a really a subject, especially on the internet, that can lead to more and more furious battles and fights, uh, the kind of which I'm not interested in getting into tonight. But as such, that's why I have no problem at all using uh, good old white bread to make my uh, SNS here, SOS here. And definitely, I had better start adding some more milk here.
And then it's just a matter of doing that again and again and again until we have the right consistency. Although, I should probably add a little bit more flavoring while I'm thinking of it. Now, as I said, this chipped beef here has more than enough salt. So normally you would add salt and pepper at this point, but I have no need to add any more salt. So that means we get to throw on a little bit of pepper. And then from there, we just keep on adding the milk. There we go. Don't worry, I do have more milk. Oh, great. That's the other thing. I'd spill everything. Oh, well. Still, we're off to a pretty good start already. And now, in fact, I've got to thicken it up a little bit. But that sure didn't take long at all, did it? And it didn't really use a lot of milk, although I could probably add more if I want to. Um, yeah, in fact, I should probably turn the heat up just a wee bit now. May have turned the heat down a little too much. Don't worry, it'll heat up quickly, though. Once we do this, I'm, gonna th I'm going to uh, work on another classic American dish, and that is we've got some cornbread in the making in yet another American pan. But speaking of American pans, as I mentioned already, they've over the past decade or so, oh, good, toast is ready. Haha. <laughs> That didn't take long at all. Oh, hot, 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 hot. Good old toast. Gonna have that's the shingles, of course, for our SOS. Uh, the other thing we need to put into this stuff a ah, little bit of Worcestershire sauce. There you go. And yeah, this is thickening up already, too. Yeah, as I mentioned, one thing is over the past decade or so, yes, they have been uh, producing quite a few American-themed cast iron pans, in particular the ones from Cracker Barrel, but not only them. I mean, we've got Camp Chef, for instance, and their, uh, their pans that uh, are still paying tribute to the uh, Lewis and Clark expedition. Uh, Lodge, of course, has come out with a number of uh, patriotic skillets. As I mentioned, there was their Made in America series, which, in fact, they also re-released this year. And that's one thing that uh, they, one thing that uh, I mentioned um, in that between nine, between uh, 2018 and 2020, they released a series of uh, three different uh, cast iron pans with an America theme to them. The 1918 pan, which in fact is right here, and this one is also heating up, though I may, not, though I may or may not actually use it at this point, was the uh, Lodge um, Made in America pan. This one, of course, has the year on it that it was produced, 2018. And yet this year, they have come out with a new Made in America pan that does not have the year on it. Uh, this obviously means that their Made in America series, at least those pans in that series, sold very well to the point where Lodge must have decided that uh, it would be good for them to just simply uh, sell that, that design in per, uh, continuously and not just in any particular year. Yeah, because, you know, the American flag is such an immortal uh, icon. And so as a result... They took the same flag design from the 2018 pan and have uh, reproduced the Made in America uh, skillet this year without having to do any, um, you know, uh, changing it or put any deadline on it. So uh, some folks have already bought the uh, Made in America pan from this year, and congratulations to you if you have. Uh, but most importantly, if you have, in fact, uh, bought that Made in America pan, don't be afraid to use it. There we go. This will probably be more than enough milk now for everything. Okay. Yeah, don't be afraid to use it. I mean, much like this Walking Liberty skillet here, um, it is. these pans are made to be used. Uh, they're much better used in the kitchen than just simply sitting on a shelf. I know dealers will say that ruins the collector's value. Well, then, if you're going to be that kind of a hoarder, Get more than one. I myself would rather cook with this uh, Walking Liberty skillet than just simply have it sitting around 
gathering dust. Nonetheless, there we go. Here, in fact, is our hamburger gravy along with some chipped beef. So now, in fact, I could probably even turn up the heat. All we have to do now is pour it on. And enjoy. Truly American dish, folks. Shite on a shangle. Oops, sorry, there we go. Shite on a shangle. Uh, SOS. Uh, yes, I know. The official name is, in fact, just that, chipped beef on toast. And it's largely because of the, all of those American soldiers who uh, ate this for breakfast year after year during service that they uh, actually uh, gave it gave it the name SOS, which uh, is re remembered so fondly, or maybe not so fondly. <laughs> and two million American sol I said million. Two million American soldiers can't really be wrong, can they? Well, you know, as I said, I'm not about to get into politics. <laughs> Nonetheless, there's not a bad way to break in this uh, Cracker Barrel skillet. And I'm going to have one little taste, and then we will uh, move on. Because once we do that, I'll get to show off some cast iron here. I'm doing this as quickly as... There we go. Just dig in a little bit of this. Mmm. Mm. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. There is definitely flavor in this, too. The ground beef plus the chip beef. Mm. And it was a good thing I did not add any salt to it. That's for sure. <laughs> mm. Still, this is something that I would be proud to serve any guest in my home for breakfast or otherwise. Mm. Wouldn't be a bad thing to make a Memorial Day, in fact. <laughs> but as I mentioned already... Um, the Cracker Barrel series, that started out, in fact, uh, going on about, well, it was 2011. Yeah, that's right. So that means it's now been 11 years um, that they since they started doing their uh, annual uh, series of, um, whew, excuse me, their, their annual series of cast iron uh, skillets with an American theme. The first two years, in fact, they did not actually call it the American Heritage Series. They were just simply producing these patriotic-themed skillets, and they uh, were successful enough that uh, they made it a yearly thing. And it was in 2014 that they released the first of their uh, American Heritage Series, one which also happened, by the way, to be a coin. And it's another one that I'm proud to own myself. And that would be the Buffalo Nickel Skillet. This one, of course, as I mentioned, first debuted at Cracker Bell in uh, 2014. And they did it the way they've been doing all of their uh, pans each year. They premiered it officially for Memorial Day, although it was available earlier than that. And it sold out quickly. It sold out indeed before the 4th of July. But then something unusual happened in that Lodge started producing the Buffalo Nickel Skillet on its own and putting its own stamp on it, or label, I should say. Uh, of course, they had already made the Buffalo Nickel Skillet for Cracker Barrel, too, so it's not like they were ripping them off in any way. Um, the big thing about the um, Buffalo Nickel Skillet, of course, is that it was based on a design of an actual coin based on a design from the United States government. And that meant, of course, that uh, technically there was really no copyright on that image. So therefore, Lodge was free to do what they wanted with it, meaning that once they were finished producing it for Cracker Bell, they could just continue producing it on their own. And so they did. They kept on producing the Buffalo Nickel Skillet for several years after that, and, in fact, I did not even get mine from uh, Cracker Barrel. Um, it had sold out when I went looking for it. However, I actually got the Buffalo Nickel Skillet from, Wal from Walmart, their website, actually. They were selling the uh, 
Buffalo nickel skillet for a, a number of years. Uh, uh, excuse me. Boy. Anyway, for a number of years, but um, with prices ranging as low as, I kid you not, $15, and then getting higher at some point to maybe $25 or $30 or so. Um, I'm not entirely sure if the Buffalo Nickel Skillet is still available. Lodge may have produced another run of that skillet as a way of kind of like promoting the um, Cracker Barrel series. So anyone who wants the Buffalo Nickel Skillet may still be able to get it. But nonetheless, that was the uh, 2012, yeah, the 2014 skillet. The next year was the first one with a design uh, unique to Cracker Barrel, one that was, in fact, copyrighted. And so Lodge has never produced any more of, the, of uh, their next skillet in the series. Uh, this is one as well that I'm proud to own because I think this one is a, a very nice design to it. And that was what they called the American Seal. So, yeah, this is a very, very attractive pan, and I'm actually quite happy to own this one. Um, in fact, the reason why I own this one was this one was actually given to me as a gift, as it seems to be the case with a number of items in my collection, by none other than, um, well, Jeff Rogers, the culinary fanatic, in fact. He uh, produced, uh, no, he was uh, really heavily into... Uh, collecting in those days and he seasoned one of those and actually gave that to me as a gift when I went to the uh, National Cornbread Festival for the first time. So that makes it a special piece to have in my collection and one again that I intend to keep and have no use to have no reason to get rid of it. Um, from there, Cracker Barrel started producing their uh, their American Heritage series every year with different designs. Some of them actually, were not as uh, attractive in my eye as uh, others in that some of them had the, had these uh, logos on them, like the Mount Rushmore skillet, um, for instance, or even the George Washington skillet. And while they were nice enough, they were not the type of things I really wanted to own. I mean, I've said already, I don't need my uh, cast iron. I don't need to have wall hangers in my collection i don't want i really don't want to own every single cast iron skillet that they come out with there's no way i can work my way through all of them so as a result i ended up passing over several of those uh pieces and um really it's like i've only acquired one more in the cracker barrel series up until the lady of uh, the uh, walking liberty skillet this year and that was the one that said uh, the midnight ride of paul revere which I got largely because of my New England heritage. <laughs> so um, while we're doing that as well, let me uh, go back to a couple of comments, and then I think I'm going to move on to part two. Yeah, but I'm weak. Yes, that's what I said as well when I bought that uh, Walking Liberty skillet. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's like the weakness just uh, is too much for us. <laughs> um. Question, in, what, in your opinion, what BSR Red Mountain Dutch ovens are hard to find? 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12. Have you ever seen a 6? Uh, I've only seen one seven, one number 9 so far. Well, the Red Mountain series in general can be hard to find because they were made so long ago, of course, and have, and have since been, uh, you know, uh, BSR produced so many in the Century series. Um on the Facebook group for uh, cast for BSR collectors, I have in fact seen that uh, um, I believe I did see a number six Red Mountain skillet. I don't think I've ever seen a number six Dutch oven. Um, there is somebody actually did uncover a Red Mountain number nine Dutch oven. By far the most common BSR Dutch oven, whether it's older or newer, would be the number eight size which is uh, still not too hard to find even these days. And then from there, um, you do get into the higher numbers, which are harder to find but not impossible. I used to own a BSR, Red, uh, BSR Century Series number 10, for instance, until it was actually too small for me, and I moved up to my BSR number 12 Dutch oven, which is still Century Series. Cast iron nerd that I am, I can feel I want to uh, one of these days get a Red Mountain series <laughs> Dutch oven. But uh, who knows if and when I'll ever 
be uh, lucky enough to do that. So, <laughs> <clears throat> Debbie, I like to make SOS with sausage and gravy. Love that with buttermilk biscuits, and you can't go wrong with that. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> Sorry. Government publications are public domain. Yeah, most works of the United States government are public domain. There is something of a gray area. It would require some research, but in general, that's one reason why, as long as you're not actually counterfeiting money, you can do things like that, like put the image of the Buffalo nickel skillet or the, wa or the Walking Liberty half dollar onto a cast iron pan. And so I'm hoping that Lodge does indeed produce more of the Walking Liberty skillet so that a lot of people will be able to uh, own that one over the next few years or so. <laughs> Dr. M, I don't think I've seen one that I could recognize as Red Mountain. Lots of century stuff. Um, well, the Red Mountain series is not too hard to identify. It has the BSR shape, including a pore spout on it, and just simply the BSR mark, which is a uh, size, number, and mold letter. So like an 8A or 8B or all the way through every number of the alphabet, for instance. So <clears throat> they're not too hard to find. Asian-made pans, as a reminder, even their Dutch ovens in general have absolutely no markings at all on the bottom. Um, so if you see one with a completely blank bottom, it's likely that it's made in Asia. Not, not every single time, but almost always especially where Dutch ovens are concerned. So, and Papa Dan, I'm through eating supper right now. Yeah, I know. I think that might be about all I can eat as well. Um, let me see. Uh, old fashioned coffee pot. I need to devise a pot, a pan hanger between two cupboards over the sink <laughs> with thick plank bo uh, bolted down the cupboards top and some solid hoods to hang my uh, griddle and skillets. Well, did, well, when it's all done, please uh, let us know how it turned out. Uh, the number nine was worth the trip to me. Oh, you found a number nine in good shape, but but been in storage. Going to strip it and redo it. Won't get rid of any bugs that way. And congratulations, then. It sounds like you made one heck of a score. So I have no arguments at all about that. And with that, I think we will go on to uh, part two of this. And now that I've had uh, two bites of supper... Got to put this aside now. Move this over here. And instead, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm going to move this over a little bit. I think we will start preparing dessert now and make ourselves some good old cornbread. Uh, like it or not, I'm sorry to say, folks, this is going to be a sweet cornbread, though, of the kind that I grew up with. So it's like a New England style or Yankee style cornbread. That means, besides the fact that I've got a mixture here of uh, cornmeal and masa harina corn flour, there is, in fact, sugar in this cornbread. So <laughs> I'm sorry if you want to go to war over that, but this is uh, really the way I like my cornbread. So that is... Uh, what I am making tonight. <laughs> and actually, I could probably use this a little better than that whisk. So now that we've done that, um, okay, I've got the recipe on my website, by the way, for skillet cornbread, both the sweet kind that I'm making here and savory cornbread. Uh, even though, as I mentioned, <clears throat> I have a preference for the uh, sweeter cornbread. Having said that, Let's get on with this, and that means from here, it's only a matter of uh, switching over to the wet ingredients. So, let me uh, check over here. All right, wet ingredients. Okay, <clears throat> now from here. All right, um, let me get measure out, Okay. Here is where I cheat a little bit because, as you know, the best cornbread is made with buttermilk. And I almost never seem to have buttermilk on hand. So I kind of cheat and instead use uh, one cup of milk. Let me put the cover of it on that so that I don't uh, spoil it. And to that, we've got, here it is, 
about a tablespoon of good old apple cider vinegar. Yes, I'm actually putting vinegar in this cornbread mix. It helps to uh, curdle the milk even as it bakes. So I, for one, actually like the uh, consistency of that. So there we go. This, by the way, is not the final amount of liquid that I'll be putting in this. Um, because after this, I'm going to have to mix in a little bit more milk as well to give it the right consistency, you know, the consistency of cornbread batter. Nonetheless, to that, I am also need to throw in an egg, one egg. Come on, do this right, good enough, there you go. We've got an egg here. And to that, we've got four tablespoons or half a stick of melted butter, which I actually did take the time to melt. And that is a good, good enough excuse. Oh, I hope I can do this without spilling it. Uh, ouch, damn it. Okay, there we are. Here we are. And an ashtray skillet, in fact. We have got one half stick of melted butter. There you go, which is one thing I like using these ashtray skillets for. And this is an older lodge skillet too, for that matter, and a lodge uh, ashtray skillet. So we've got a little bit of melted butter in here. Let me put this back. And Finally, okay, yeah, no, we just mix all this in, and, oh, and then we're going to uh, start uh, bringing it to the right consistency. So, let's see, here again, make sure I'm not missing anything, because now, as I said, we get through all this together, and then we're going to be mixing in more milk in order to give this the uh, right kind of batter, because, yes, it is, in fact, still kind of dry. I mean, there's really... No question about that. That's why it's like the gravy earlier, adding just the right amount of liquid until it reaches the uh, right consistency. So I am, it's uh, right now, I just have to make sure everything is thoroughly mixed together, which doesn't take too long. There we go. And then from here, start adding the milk. A little bit. And it doesn't take long for the milk to mix in with this stuff either. So I'm probably not even going to need much more than what I just added, which I would guess might have been, oh, I don't know, a third of a cup, half a cup. And yet already, as you can see, we've got some, it's uh, definitely starting, let me put this over here, starting to take on the uh, consistency of cornbread batter. So that certainly didn't, didn't take long at all, did it? There we go. Which also means, you know, maybe a wee bit more milk. I mean, this is a nice thick consistency right now. Maybe a tiny bit more milk, but not much. There we go. That might have been a couple of tablespoons worth. And once this, this is all mixed in, I've got one other ingredient to add to this. One that even though folks may not approve of sugar in cornbread, there's one thing that a lot of them do approve of in cornbread and that would be <laughs> honey <laughs> winnie the pooh's favorite food and the official recipe calls for about a third of a cup of honey but uh the important thing of course is that you get it nice and sweet here there you go mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. no i did not touch the batter Mm. Oh, yeah, nice. This is good stuff, too. Mm. That is some good honey. I got that from an international market in our area, in fact. All right. 
So now we'll mix all this together. And now we're definitely going to have ourselves a nice honey cornbread, right? Well, that means, and I probably should have done this a couple of minutes ago, in fact. I hope I didn't make a mistake. What mistake? Well, this mistake. Oh, yeah, this batter has a nice consistency now. But what I forgot to do, move this to the side carefully, is, in fact, prepare the pan that we'll be making the cornbread in. So, move this over right now. Here it is. Ah. There we go. You may remember a few minutes ago I said I like using corn oil, which is exactly what we're going to be using here. That and a preheated cast iron pan. I have, in fact, been preheating one particular pan in the oven, especially for this uh, cornbread, which means I've got to move this out of the side, over to the side for just a second as we get that hot, hot cast iron pan out of the oven. And here we go. Check that out, shall we? Haha. <laughs> Yes, indeed. I think I had mentioned this one before, the uh, United, this United States cast iron pan, which is, in fact, made in Asia. I'm sorry to say it is not USA made. Uh, on the other hand, I found this pan at TJ Maxx on my birthday uh, about a year, almost two years ago, for $10. So considering that yeah, you better believe I was not going to pass this up. So anyway, we get this all. There we go. And actually, now that we've done that, we've got to get this back in the oven for just a minute or so to properly heat up the oil. But this won't take long, I promise. And along with that, we've got a second pan. Continuing our Made in America theme. Here is a BSR Century Series. Let me do this right. Oh, this is hot. Century Series number three, made in USA, cast iron skillet. Ow, that is definitely hot. <laughs> okay, that means now just to get to add a little bit more of that corn oil. Uh, the rec For the record, the volume of that uh, USA pan, the one that's shaped like the USA, um, is well, maybe a teeny bit more is in fact um, I measured it out and used some geometry and I estimate that the pan probably has the same or maybe very very a fraction of a bit more volume as a number five size cast iron skillet so I figure between that and this number three pan should be more than enough to uh, you know the cornbread batter that I made should be able to fill mo both of these with little difficulty. So let's get this one over here in the oven. And let's pull out the first one. Because everything is definitely nice and hot here. Wow. If I'm not going to be careful, this is going to burn me right through my right through this glove. All right. Well, that means, mix this a little bit more. And here is the uh, secret I learned to making cornbread. And that secret would be the sizzle. No, not just that sizzle. There we go, we put the extra oil here. Mix it up one last time. Notice, by the way, it's the same method I use for making my cakes in the bunt pan. I learned that method, in fact, from here, and it has served me well. I'm talking about this sizzle. There you go. And with that, getting the batter all over the place as usual. 
Let's get this back into the oven one more time. Same thing now uh, with the number three. Which just does mean at which means a little bit more oil yet in the batter. Alright, so anyway, novice that I am, that is the method of how I learned to make cornbread going on, wow, about 10 years or so ago. And frankly, I like this method. I think it turns out very nice cornbread. There we go. Should be just enough. And let's get this in the oven. And then, especially because of the size of these pans, I doubt we'll have to wait even 20 minutes before it's done. Let's just get this nice and careful like do not want to spill it. There we go. <laughs> and we're good. Boy. So anyway, that is part two of our uh, Memorial Day uh, USA cast iron pan cooking tonight. So we are off to a pretty good start here. Wow, we're already an hour in. I don't know where the time always goes. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, as I mentioned already, uh, again, yeah, I mean, Cracker Barrel Lodge has been producing those American pans for Cracker Barrel for uh, the last 11 years now. And then over the past, uh, between 19, uh, 2018 and 2020, I keep saying 1918, they uh, produced their own Made in America series. Interestingly enough, the first and last pan in those pans in that series were big sellers and not so much the uh, 2019 pan. <laughs> Do you know if uh, Nessius, uh River Catfish, and do you know if Lodge is still producing the Buffalo Nickel? I seen one locally at a hardware store the other day. Well, if you want it and if you have a need for it, then I would definitely say to go and grab it. Now, I say if you have a need for it, again, it's what you want to do with it. I encourage using, uh, my, using pans as much as possible, but if you want a wall hanger, that's your choice. Nonetheless, though, if you see the buffalo nickel skillet, I would probably recommend getting it if you want it. Um, I mentioned just a little bit ago that I don't know if Lodge is still producing the buffalo nickel skillet. They were, in fact, producing it for several years, and I believe as recently as a couple of years ago, they were still producing it. Now that the, um, now that the um, Cracker Barrel skillet has come in, they could very well have done another run of the uh, Buffalo Nic Nickel Skillet. Because after all, number one, Lodge makes, makes that, uh, those pans for Cracker Barrel. So it's not exactly that they're competing with themselves. So if cra those Cracker Barrel Skillets sell good, well, Lodge does good business then. And number two, there's the possibility, again, maybe, I, I can't guarantee, I don't work for Lodge, I can't speak for them, maybe Lodge will continue to uh, produce the uh, Walking Liberty uh, half-dollar pan uh, after it sells out from Cracker Barrel. But I can, pre I can pretty much guarantee it's going to sell out, yes, besides the fact that almost all of them do. That is such a nice... One moment, sorry. It's okay. Didn't disrupt anything. Sorry about that. Uh, not to worry, not to worry. All right. So anyway, I'm hoping that uh, Lodge does, in fact, produce the uh, Buffalo Nickel Skillet. No, I'm sorry. The uh, Walking Liberty Skillet after it sells out at Cracker Barrel. Uh, Turner Trial and Error. Okay. I can see I'm going to have to take a look here. Turner Fowler, Val Black Hat Rule. She put on too much oil and Dutch oven got gummy. Oh, yeah. What is what? Oh, I believe that's SOS. Help yourself. Toast. Oh, yes, indeed. Oh, wait, did you use a toaster for the first time? Yes, I did. Oh, well, no, I, not the first time. I, I have actually, things, yes. Right. But nonetheless, there you go. And I made sure to make it with hamburger as well as the chipped beef. And I think it turned out good. Mm -hmm. mm, oh, yeah. Yeah, no, the uh, hamburg, I think, really helps besides the fact that it absorbs a lot of the salt from that chipped beef. 
it also really the flavor goes well i think the uh beef and the uh, and the hamburg it also helps it also helps to spell some of the ptsd <laughs> on the mres mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, just spells when that PTSD filled over from the MREs that you see. Oh, yeah. yeah. MREs, yes. Oh. <laughs> mm. Yuck. <laughs> ah. Everybody remembers MREs, meals rejected by everyone. Yeah. Or the less politically correct was meals rejected by Ethiopians. Yeah. <clears throat> you didn't hear that. I was talking about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But definitely tell safe to spell that. Mm -hmm. MRE, yes. Mm. Meals ready to eat. Or as they say, Three lies in one sentence. Yeah. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's delicious. Well, 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 there's plenty here, so mm -hmm. go ahead, have it all. We can always make more. Mm -hmm. All we got to do is put some toast. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like that uh, that SOS is a hit, so I'm quite happy about that. Anyway, she put on too much oil and her Dutch oven got gummy. She's new to cast iron cooking. That happens to all of us. Nothing to worry about. I mean, yes, what it does mean is that you will have some blotchy spots on the cast iron. No big deal. My advice would be, number one, if it's still gummy, uh, take that pan, stick it back in the oven, and heat the oven up to really high temperature, like maybe about 500 degrees, and let it bake for an hour or so. That will harden that uh, gumminess, and it will no longer be gummy. Yes, it will still have blotches on it, and that's inevitable. There's nothing wrong with that. Start cooking after that, uh, because after a little while of cooking, the color will even out. The blotches will be covered up, and you will have a fine-looking cast iron pan. So there is nothing at all to worry about, Turner. You can pass that on to her, uh, that, that her pan, again, there's nothing to worry about. I would advise just that. Start cooking with it and keep cooking with it. Papa Dan, BSR quit making their number seven in the late 70s, but then came out with the 8B7 skillet. Uh, that seems to be the case. The log What was the logic behind this move? The logic behind this move was to make their number eight series more compatible with other kitchen items, especially glass lids, which were very popular, and BSR never made them. So instead, they produced a pan that was uh, that would be that was the same size as pretty much every other pan on the market, and that became the new number eight. The other reason, and this was a big cost-cutting move for BSR, that little difference, that little fraction of an inch smaller, also meant they could completely redesign the pattern that they used for the mold, and they could actually produce two pans at the same time in either the same pattern or the same mold, I forget what which, essentially double their production of cast iron skillets using the same number of molds and patterns. So that was a big cost cutter, uh, and that would really be a big incentive for them to make that size change like that. A few other BSR pans were resized in that manner during the 1970s as well. Uh, I have a number 10 BSR Century with a very unusual size that says 12 and I think it's 7 16th inches because they did a very slight readjustment of the size from the older 12 and 5 eighths inches. So um, that little difference, I mean... It was had to have been intentional, so you better believe. So there were certainly uh, reasons behind it. But anyway, the logic behind this move, it really more than anything else, business. You know, they were wanted to cut costs and thereby increase profits. That, of course, is the rule behind any business decision. There's nothing evil about that. So um, whether or not it worked, well, hard to say. Because after all, this was in the mid-70s, and BSR ended up folding for good only about 15 years later. So make, make what you will of that. Turner, trial and error. She'll get it. Buffalo nickels are available again, says Honey Badger. Well, that answers that. So I did that my first time, too. Just bake it in the oven at 450 for a while, and it will unstickify. Yes, exactly. Bob S., let's eat. Let's eat. Debbie, I love cornbread batter than I like than I like buttermilk biscuits. 
Lordy, my poor mama couldn't make cornbread, but she made the best biscuits you could eat. Oh, well, there's good memory for you. And I can only hope this uh, SOS here tonight kind of inspires you to uh, make some. Please, you know, you know, because have some fun. You'll enjoy it. <clears throat> uh, Christine Borgatti, I had some gum, but I just kept scrubbing it every time I cooked, and now it's gone. I don't know how to heat it up. Um, well, that, of course, you know, seasoning a pan is something of a science, and, and there are literally dozens of correct ways to do it. There is no one right way to season a pan. That's one reason why you, we've got all of these videos. You know how everybody, they get started out with their own cast iron video channel, whether it's on YouTube or TikTok or wherever Almost always they're going to say, here's how to season a cast iron pan. Here's how to clean up a cast iron pan. You know, just like here's how to cook a steak in cast iron. <laughs> well, yes, I do it with bacon. That's true. But um, anyway, the point is, is just that, is that there is no one single right way to season cast iron. There are many right ways to season cast iron. It is really hard to screw it up, in fact. Even if you end up putting the oil on too thick and baking it at too low a temperature, um, no, you, don't ex you haven't exactly screwed it up. I mean, it did not produce the best seasoning. Well, then you fix it, just exactly like we said. You re-bake it in the oven, and there you go. You've got a seasoned cast iron pan. There's nothing to worry about. I mean, really, that's the nice thing. I, one of the attractions of cast iron is that it is so friendly. It's, it's easy to use. It will, I mean, the pan, it's almost impossible to mess it up. It's almost impossible to damage a cast iron pan. Yes, it is possible, of course. Probably the easiest way would be to just drop it on the floor. But as long as you take some basic and simple precautions, it's almost impossible to mess up your cast iron pan. There's really nothing to be afraid of. Go ahead and try it. Go ahead and try seasoning it. Go ahead and try cooking it in, 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 in your cast iron. Uh, you know, whether you're making cornbread or SOS or steak or, oh, I don't know, so, uh, some more fancy dishes, for instance. Um, basically, all you really need to do is just get started and give it a try. You know, because what's the worst that's going to happen? You might burn the food. Okay, so you get burned food. The cast iron is still there, and you could always try again or just make something else. I've said this many times, and I like this mantra that I have for myself, the one that goes, in cooking, there are a few disasters and many learning experiences. Fortunately, we can still eat the learning experiences. So if it doesn't turn out quite right, it's a learning experience. As long as you can eat it, it's a success. <laughs> and boy, I can say that uh, as well with a number of the dishes that I've made here in my live uh, live session. I mean, you've seen it. Some of my dishes have not really turned out so good, unfortunately. Some of them I'm very proud of, and I'm really glad I did it, in fact. Uh, some, well, well, at least, as I said, we've had a learning experience because we can still eat it. I don't think I've completely ruined anything in these li in these live videos yet, <laughs> and hopefully I never will. Uh, having said that, let's get a quick peek, shall we, of that cornbread, see how it looks. Ooh, nice so far. However, it is still all yellow on top, so uh, it's a few more minutes yet. We, we don't have the uh, brown on the top, so it, it looks like it's doing pretty good, though. Cynthia Wesley, thanks for the reminder. OFCP. I uh, love bread. Okay, yeah, we said that part. Thanks for that info. Just couldn't figure out why they kept making a skillet the same size, but uh, renumbered. Well, yes, exactly. Uh, when I first started cooking, I made a meal the dog wouldn't eat. I think we could all say that. Uh, years ago, when I was maybe a teenager or so, my mom used to love telling the story about how I uh, burned spaghetti while it was still in the water. You see, I put the uh, spaghetti in and I forgot this essential step called stirring. And I essentially, I essentially let it sit there until 
the water had mostly boiled off. And so all we had left was this big, heavy, congealed lump of pasta that, of course, was completely burned black on the bottom. <laughs> so, yeah. So I know all about uh, that. <laughs> Uh, it's a proud lesson on Boston baked beans. Well, thank you very much. I'm really glad you like that. That's the thing I maybe about the thing I like the most is when I hear people try my recipes and especially if they like them. So thank you very, very much for that. <clears throat> All right. What else here? Uh, I looked at it and called that chip beef. And yes, that is essentially what it is. Uh, I took, uh, let me get out that thing again. I took this stuff, dried beef, and cut it up into little bits. In my case, I mixed it up with some hamburger, uh, largely because, well, I will repeat what I said. This stuff is not bad. It, was, it had a very tender consistency. It was very easy to cut. But man, is that stuff ever salty on its own. Mixing it in, though, with that hamburger allowed the salt to dilute. So as a result, we've got ourselves a nice hamburger gravy there. And uh, yeah, we served it up on toast and we've got ourselves some, some shite on a shangle. <laughs> Mispronouncing it, obviously, just in case there's some kind of a bot or something on, um, uh, on uh, YouTube. Of course, on the other hand, I could probably go all out with the cussing and uh, it wouldn't be a problem. Nonetheless, I still try to keep something of a mostly family-friendly channel here because, well, this is a family-friendly subject, cooking, and I encourage people, I encourage beginners. So that would certainly mean that this should be family-friendly for the most part. After all, the vast amount of cooking in cast iron and otherwise is, in fact, done for family and friends. And that's what I like. And that's what I like about the Cast Iron Cooking Group on Facebook, too. The vast majority of the cooking that we see there is typical, everyday family cooking. People making breakfast and lunch and supper and desserts and, and some other special things, like for birthdays or for Memorial Day, for instance. Um, once in a great while, not very often there on Facebook, we see maybe a chef showing off their creations. They never seem to last long. Uh, largely because the chefs always seem to be going on to Facebook to promote themselves. Whereas most of the folks who uh, enjoy it on Facebook are just there to have fun. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm really here just to have fun. I mean, that is the first thing. That's what I said. I said before about the story of uh, when I cooked my first steak in a lodge cast iron skillet, how I absolutely ruin that steak. Remember what I said about a disaster and a learning experience? Well, I guess I'll call it a learning experience because I thought it tasted good. Little did I know I was eating leather. <laughs> but nonetheless, that was the most important thing about cooking that steak was not the fact that I ruined it. Uh, the fact that I had a lot of fun. That was what really opened my eyes to cooking and especially to cooking in cast iron. It's fun. And that's really what would really the whole point here is we're out to have fun. I remember Alton Brown's very first episode of Good Eats because he cooked steak in cast iron, of course. And one of the things he said was, you know, if, if you want cooking to be fun and we're here to see that it is, you've got to have the right tools for the job. And that was when he was in a uh, uh, hardware store looking for a cast iron pan which was Asian made, if I remember right, when he found it. Okay. Um, what else do we have here? Oh, Superman. Um, I'm trying to remember Superman. Oh, that one, Superman. Yes. Oh, yeah, no, that was just a little joke I made because, you know, it's something I've had in the back of my head. It has more to do with, uh, well, more to do with internet arguments than anything else, because I've had my share of internet arguments with these idiots who, what can you say? They deny reality, and, and it's hard to believe some of the things that they could get into. I'm not even going to describe it here, because like I said, I'm trying to avoid politics. Um, but <clears throat> I mean, really, people who just simply, it's as if they blind themselves to something completely obvious, and 
So I ended up uh, going with that little Krypton joke to, uh, you know, to describe that. You know, it's like me as a seven-year-old. How can people deny that Krypton is exploding? It's so, it's so stupid. Me today. Oh, now I know why people could deny Krypton exploding. <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Okay, golden ratio for chipped beef and sausage gravy. One stick of butter, half a cup of flour, and a quart of milk. Well, uh, here's, okay, well, yeah, that's the thing. That's because you've got equal amounts, once again, of grease, the butter, that is, and the flour. The equal amounts there, the oil and the flour, that's the key. The one quart of milk is not exact. As I mentioned earlier today, what you have to do is you have to start adding your milk a little bit at a time and stirring and adding milk and stirring and adding milk again and again and again. And I'm going to have to add more milk again when I cook with the rest of this uh, until it reaches the right consistency. If you're good and you made it good, you'll use less than a quart of milk. If you have to use more than a quart of milk, well, okay, then you have to use more than a quart of milk. The important thing is getting to the right consistency. <clears throat> I am the only person on earth that has been known to turn water into carbon in a cast iron pot. Uh, I have a feeling there are a lot of people who will look at your post and say, me too. So don't worry about that. Pretty much no matter what it is, you're not alone. People have been cooking for, you know, since the beginnings of civilization. And there are 7 billion people on this planet. Chances are, yes, somebody else did it too. <laughs> That's another thing I can consult. I can... Yeah, I condole myself for that when I screw up. So, yeah, it's been done before. <laughs> Wooden utensils are awesome. Still have my late mom's spanking spoon I use regularly. I think I'll check on that uh, cornbread one more time. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Oh, yeah. Hey, uh, I'm, even though it's getting nice and dark on the sides, I'm going to risk it for about one more minute, and then I think we will be done. Let me uh, get this two out of the way, in fact. Oh, is this on? I better turn this off. Uh, oh, good. This is cooled off a little bit. Um, but I think I'll be able to move it over here. Let's get this out of the way. And here again is the Buffalo Nickel Skillet, which, as I mentioned, came out in 2014. And then next year, they came out with ugh, the uh, American Seal Skillet, which came out in 2015, both of which I do still try to use as well. They are not just wall hangers, but let me put these aside for the moment. All right. I can only hope that I haven't burned the cornbread on the bottom. That's the uh, part that I worry about more than anything else. Nonetheless, let's see how this turned out, shall we? All right, I've got to get out my glove because this is going to be hot. A little bit, and here we are. Oh, yeah. Here's one, and here is the other. There we go. Well, actually, here we are. It's all finished. All right. Well, the live is still going, but I'm almost done. Okay. Okay. Not to not to worry. Anyway. Yes, indeed. Anyway, here is the United States skillet, and there is the BSNR number three, century number three. Yeah. Oh my God. So, assuming I didn't burn the bottom, as I hope I didn't, 
Um, one nice thing about cornbread as well as the way as I found out is that you only really have to let it sit in the pan for about a minute or so. And then we get to see how it turned out. So let me, okay, I've got to move a couple of other things to the side. I, yeah, I have limited room in this place, unfortunately. Nonetheless, let me dig out a couple of plates here. There we go. Yeah. All right, and having done that, yeah, damn it, this quickly. There we go. Okay, what do we have here? Okay, next up comes a knife, a knife. Yeah, here comes the chaos part. Either I'm going to ruin it or it's going to be a success. Well, as a matter of fact, it seems to be I barely need to uh, touch the knife to the edges at all. So that, if you ask me, is a pretty good sign. Now that means I guess it's about time for the moment of truth. And that means I also have to do this carefully because this is a glass plate and I don't want to break it. Nonetheless, mm. ta -da! dark on the bottom, but it definitely is not burned. So, okay, let me put this pan aside. Excuse me, please. Yeah. There we go. Still, I'd have to say we are uh, doing pretty good here. All I have to do is flip it. And voila, we have our USA cornbread, which is missing Florida and a little bit of Maine and the, and the and Cape Cod of Massachusetts. Still, we're, this is not a bad start at all, which means now all we have to do is number two. Okay, get that glove out again. Because again, this is still a hot pan here. Hot, hot, hot. And as before, this is running along the sides nicely. So, here we go again with number two. And with that, bam. Ooh. This one I probably could have even cooked a little bit more. But no, actually, you might even call this one almost perfect. So, yeah, I actually like this. <clears throat> even though I'm going to burn myself, let's just do this. Let's not actually. Don't be that stupid. Okay, um, let's do this then. There we go. But, um, yeah, in fact, this one, as it turned out, a little bit underdone. Crap. All right, well, there we go. Here's a learning experience for you. On the other hand, this one turned out uh, darn near perfect. <laughs> Crap. Well, one out of two. <laughs> What did I say about learning experiences? It looked nice, but I really should have checked this one first. Oh, well. At least we still have this one. Remember, that's what I said. The risks of uh, doing this cooking live, and it only shows you as well how much of an amateur I am. Well, I ruined one, but one came out successful. And just to demonstrate that, I think I could safely do this. There we go. And that, at least, is cornbread. So at least one was successful. My bad for the other one. Oh, well, fortunately, I'm only really cooking for a couple of people tonight. <laughs> All right. 
Anyway. So far, so good. Yeah, this is why I watch. This is a real kitchen with real results. Yeah, you could definitely call these real results. No question about that. Nonetheless, yeah, guess what time we are getting on to? We're already pretty much at an hour and a half here. Let me turn off the spin on the oven. And I'm hoping I've said my piece here. Because after all, as I mentioned, we said a little bit. Oh, excuse me one second. Got to close the door here. I don't want the cats getting out this way. There we go. And now at last. Anyway, if nothing else, though, we do have, we did get ourselves some good results. Uh, the SOS, I think, turned out just uh, fantabulous. And we will have plenty for there. All we've got to do is put on some more toast. And, you're, and we've got a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, SOS for that. And at least this cornbread here turned out to have pretty good as well. Just pop it back in the oven. You could even leave it on the Corel plate. Yeah, yeah, I might just do that. So, okay. And that's where, yeah, cut off a piece of North Carolina. Well, that's where I'm from. Um, yeah, it looks like I, I split it just right about down the Mississippi River, in fact. So North Carolina would be right about there. Whoops. Yeah, bump the camera. Why don't I? And nonetheless, though, we are, in fact, getting on, yeah, uh, yeah, we won't look at the other one. Yes, <laughs> that's how it goes. So, but hey, I mean, what, what can I say? It happened. It's my own fault. And I really know way to blame but myself. But as I said, we've had a lot, we actually had a lot of fun tonight. And that again is, um, is <clears throat> really the, really the whole point. Um, and most important of all, I guess, yeah, Memorial Day is coming, folks. Enjoy your cooking this weekend. Uh, here in New England, it looks like it's going to be a nice weekend here. for, uh, and, and that means, of course, there'll be a lot of good cooking. And I can only hope it's the same way for you, too. Even if the weather is not so great, well, you've got your cast iron and you could do some indoor cooking. You know, make yourself, uh, you can do your usual burgers and hot dogs and go on the grill or even do things like uh, make a jambalaya or, or uh, pulled pork or who knows. The, the important thing is uh, go out there, have some fun, and remember, again, your uh, brothers and sisters who have served the United States of America, because this is, of course, Memorial Day. And we can remember them in a good way, as well as mourn those we have lost. So, so enjoy your, really enjoy your weekend, folks. That's probably more than anything else, uh, for good and for bad. And we will... Uh, well, we will uh, do it all again next week. So thank you very much. And thank you. Hello, old fashioned coffee pod. Yeah, I won't like watching you rattle the irons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> cornbread is a mystery. And <laughs> well, the best I could say is try making cornbread and see how you like it. So uh, right down the Mississippi River. Exactly. And yeah, and I'm definitely looking forward to uh, having some of this. Okay, have a safe holiday, as Turner Fowler says. And thank you, everybody, once again, for showing up. Really, it's you folks who make this fun more than anything else. And Cynthia Wesley and Terry Sinchev. Hello, uh, Peter uh, Kinberger, Debbie, Rick Stumbaugh, uh, Gene Groove or Grube. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, Dr. M, see you all next week. I definitely intend on being here next week. And I'm, I really hope you folks are too, because as I said, that's really what makes this so much fun. Thank you very much again for showing up, folks. Have yourselves a good evening. I'll see you next Wednesday. <laughs>